The goal of this talk is to give you the skills to interpret an abdominal x-ray with more confidence. Now, if we're to be comfortable approaching an abdominal x-ray, we need to grok the abdomen's basic layout. Here's a simple axial cross-section diagram of the abdomen. If we ignore the abdominal wall and focus on the most essential part of the abdomen, we can fundamentally divide the abdomen into two compartments, one compartment that's hollow and one compartment that's fat-filled. We refer to the hollow compartment as the peritoneal cavity, and we refer to the fatty compartment as the retroperitoneum. Each compartment holds different structures. The retroperitoneum holds the great vessels, kidneys, and pancreas. If we were to look more inferiorly, we'd see three other major items living in the retroperitoneum. The duodenum, technically the entire duodenum except for its first inch, the ascending colon, and the descending colon. Three major items live in the peritoneal cavity, the liver, the spleen, and any segments of the GI tract that don't live in the retroperitoneum, meaning the stomach, jejunum, ileum, and any segments of the colon that aren't the ascending or descending colon. In the upper peritoneal cavity, the liver and stomach are connected to each other by the hepatogastric ligament, while the stomach and spleen are connected to each other by the gastrosplenic ligament. These ligaments effectively divide the peritoneal cavity into a greater peritoneal cavity and a lesser peritoneal cavity. The most gravitationally dependent portions of the peritoneal cavity belong to the greater peritoneal cavity or sac, which is why things like ascites, hemoperitoneum, peritoneal metastases, and abscesses preferentially collect within the greater sac or greater peritoneal cavity. Although fluid metastases and abscesses are less prone to collect within the lesser peritoneal cavity or sac, direct spread of disease from organ to organ, for example, pancreas or stomach, tends to be more of a problem in the lesser peritoneal cavity or sac. Now, let's look at the abdomen from a sagittal perspective. For frame of reference, I've highlighted the lesser peritoneal cavity in light yellow. On a sagittal view, we see the transverse mesocolon that connects the transverse colon to the posterior wall of the abdomen, and we see the greater omentum, which is chock full of fat and blood vessels, and a fertile ground for implantation of metastases in the peritoneal cavity and a popular location for abscesses too. We see the lesser omentum, which predominantly consists of the gastropathic ligament. The lesser omentum transmits the coronary veins from which varices can arise, and it also contains many lymph nodes which can enlarge when involved by malignancies like stomach cancer or lymphoma. It's really helpful if we have a good grasp of the extent, the location, the shape, and the boundaries of these different compartments of the abdomen, since it's a very helpful tool we'll rely on to better understand diseases in the abdomen and their imaging. If we're able to identify which compartment an abnormality occurs in, it can sometimes make it a lot easier to pin down its origin and cause. Now, the interpretation of abdominal CTs and x-rays would be a lot easier if the peritoneal cavity were inflated with air, like I've been drawing on these slides, and the organs nicely separated. However, in real life, the peritoneal cavity is air-free, and the abdomen actually looks like this, which is why understanding each compartment's boundaries is important uh, when we're interpreting an abdominal CT image or an abdominal x-ray. When it comes to imaging options for the abdomen, I tend to think of abdominal x-rays as a triage tool, kind of like a stethoscope. And other modalities like CT, ultrasound, and MRIs as diagnostic tools that can provide or point the way to a much more specific diagnosis. But let's focus on the topic of this talk, abdominal x-rays or radiographs. Radiographs work best for showing interfaces between materials of very different density, like the interfaces between air and soft tissue, or the interfaces between soft tissue and calcium. That's why radiographs are pretty helpful for um, things like lungs and skeletal disorders. Radiographs are less effective, however, 
for showing interfaces between materials of similar density, like the interfaces between one kind of soft tissue to another kind of soft tissue. That's why when compared to chest and bone films, abdominal radiographs tend to be less information rich, less sensitive, and less specific. And the numbers performed every day, um, less than chest and extremity x-rays. Nonetheless, the ability to characterize air versus soft tissue interfaces and calcium versus soft tissue interfaces on radiographs can be useful for appraising, say, the GI tract, which usually contains gas, and also useful for looking for abnormal calcification patterns in the abdomen that may hint to the presence of a particular acute abdominal disease. And that's why abdominal x-rays, despite their limitations, remain a useful triage tool for evaluating patients with acute abdominal pain. The differential diagnosis for acute abdominal pain uh, includes obstructive disorders like gallstones, urinary tract um, calculi and obstruction, and bowel obstruction. Neurogenic disorders like adynamic ileus, inflammatory disorders such as acute cholecystitis, pancreatitis, appendicitis, and so on. Infectious disorders such as basal pneumonia, intraabdominal abscesses, pyelonephritis, and so on. And vascular disorders such as inferior wall MIs, acute aortic syndromes, and other intraabdominal ischemic conditions. So, which of the disorders on this chart do we have a sporting chance of recognizing on an abdominal radiograph? Well, bowel obstructions, adynamic ileus, and basal pneumonias can cause um, somewhat specific abnormal gas soft tissue patterns or interfaces that we can perceive on an abdominal x-rays. So they're on the list of disorders we might have a shot at recognizing on an abdominal film. While not every gallstone, urinary tract calculus, or appendicolith is calcified or symptomatic, seeing a calcification pattern typical for a gallstone, urinary tract calculus, or appendicolith may reasonably warrant further diagnostic workup for obstructing gallstones, acute cholecystitis, urinary tract uh, obstruction, or acute appendicitis in the setting of acute abdominal pain. Likewise, while not every calcified abdominal aorta or calcified abdominal aortic aneurysm is acutely symptomatic, and for that matter, not every abdominal aortic aneurysm calcified, seeing a calcification pattern typical of an abdominal aortic aneurysm could very reasonably warrant further workup for an acute aortic syndrome in a patient with acute abdominal pain. So when we read abdominal films for a patient with acute abdominal pain, we have a realistic opportunity to identify a bowel obstruction, a dynamic ileus or basal pneumonia, if one of those happens to be the culprit. Although abdominal x-rays will be much less sensitive and less specific for diagnosing gallstones, urinary tract obstruction, um, um, appendicitis, and acute aortic syndromes, Abdominal x-rays can provide some of the evidence used to build a case for the workup and diagnosis for these conditions. Now, a traditional acute abdominal x-ray series consists of an upright frontal chest x-ray and abdominal x-rays with the patient in a supine and either upright or decubitus position. The upright um, or decubitus, um, sorry, the upright chest x-ray is used um, is included to improve our ability to diagnose free error in the peritoneal cavity and to diagnose any intrathoracic disorders, for example, a basal pneumonia that could present as abdominal pain. The upright or decubitus abdominal X-ray is performed in addition to the supine view to help us recognize air fluid levels that can improve our confidence with the diagnosis of some intraabdominal disorders. For portable studies performed at the bedside, most often just a supine abdominal radiograph may be obtained with or without a portable chest x-ray. With abdominal radiographs, um, while um, abdominal radiographs can be used to diagnose or open the door to the diagnosis of many disorders, uh, particularly in the hands of an experienced um, abdominal radiologist, for the purpose of this talk, um, I will concentrate on what I consider to be the two 
highest yield portions of their interpretation in daily practice. Assessing the gas pattern on the image and knowing the top abnormal calcifications to be on the lookout for it in the abdomen. Gas occurs normally in the abdomen, but should only exist inside the GI tract. The normal gas inside the GI tract comes from air that we swallow, um, carbonated beverages we may drink, and gas produced by the bacterial flora in our colon. Most of the time we can distinguish whether a gas pocket in the GI tract is inside the stomach, small bowel, or colon. Gas inside the stomach can be recognized by its location in the left and or midline upper abdomen and the thick rugal folds outlined along the margin of the gas pocket. Gas inside the colon can be recognized by its more peripheral distribution and repetitive transverse bands partially interrupting the gas column, which correspond to the colonic haustra. Modeled material corresponding to stool is also very helpful in identifying the colon. Gas inside the small bowel can be recognized by its more central distribution and faint tightly packed transverse bands corresponding to the valvulae conventes, which are more visually subtle, thinner, uniformly spaced, and um, closely spaced um, than colonic haustra. On a normal abdominal film, we expect to see some gas in the stomach, gas in a few small bowel loops, not exceeding three centimeters in caliber, and gas in several colonic segments. Um, the colonic segments usually being about three to five um, centimeters in caliber. Sometimes uh, we'll spot gas within the cecum too, which can normally be as large as eight centimeters. Air fluid levels are normally visible inside the GI tract on an upright or decubitus image. It's normal to see an air fluid level in the stomach and in colon upstream from the hepatic flexure. It's also normal to see a few air fluid levels inside non-dilated small bowel that are relatively close in height from each other. Here's an example of a normal air fluid level in the stomach and some normal air fluid levels in small bowel um, in yellow and in the colon in blue on an upright abdominal film and some normal air fluid levels in the small bowel in yellow and in the colon in blue on a decubitus image. If all of these features we've described on the last couple of slides here um, characterize a normal abdominal gas pattern, what features constitute an abnormal abdominal gas pattern? Well, it's usually not normal uh, to have dilated gas-filled GI tract. That means gas-filled small bowel over three centimeters diameter, colon over five centimeters diameter, or cecum over eight centimeters diameter. It's usually not normal to encounter small bowel air fluid levels if there are too many in number, too wide in diameter, or if the air fluid levels are spaced over two centimeters apart in height from the ground. It's usually not normal to encounter air fluid levels in colon downstream from the hepatic flexure. It's also unusual if there is an absence of gas and stool in colon downstream from the hepatic flexure, which can suggest that the downstream colon and rectum are entirely empty and collapsed. It's usually not normal when the valvulae conventes of the small bowel are prominent. It's also not normal if the colonic haustra are either entirely absent or if mark the haustra are markedly thickened, especially if they're so thickened that thumb printing begins to occur. And always be careful whenever intra-abdominal gas does not appear to be situated inside the GI tract. The presence of any of these findings um, that we've listed here um, in this um, chart in the setting of abdominal pain should prompt us to look for the presence of a mechanical bowel obstruction, a dynamic ileus, um, inflammatory bowel disease, sentinel small bowel loop, toxic megacolon, or pneumoperitoneum. Mechanical bowel obstructions. Um, mechanical bowel obstructions occur when an intraluminal bowel mass 
bowel stricture, or external mass effect obstructs the normal downstream transit of bowel contents. When an obstruction occurs, the backup of bowel contents behind the obstruction causes the bowel upstream of the obstruction point to progressively dilate and become filled with a combination of fluid and gas. Small bowel obstructions happen much more often than large bowel obstructions, outnumbering them 4 to 1. Small bowel obstructions account for a fair share of all surgical admissions for acute abdominal pain, and abdominal x-rays are reasonably sensitive and specific for their diagnosis. Adhesions from prior abdominal surgery are the most common cause of small bowel obstructions in places like North America and Europe, while the most common cause in low-income countries um, are incarcerated hernias. Abnormal abdominal gas patterns that may occur in a small bowel obstruction include distended small bowel loops that are over 3 centimeters in diameter. Um, the colon and any small bowel downstream of the obstruction site will usually be collapsed, resulting in a paucity of distal small bowel gas and colonic gas, rendering them imperceptible on an x-ray. Um, abdominal air fluid levels uh, may occur in small bowel upstream from the obstruction on upright or decubitus images. These air fluid levels um, may be too many to widen caliber or um, of too many different heights. Abnormally thickened small bowel folds or valvulae canaventes may present may be present um, in some small bowel obstruction cases too, resulting in a stack of coins appearance. On this supine x-ray, we see multiple segments of air-filled small bowel that are over three centimeters in diameter and no perceptible colonic gas or stool since, they're, um, since the colon's probably empty and collapsed. And we also see uh, pronounced valvulae canaventes in the left abdomen. On a corresponding upright x-ray, not only do we see multiple segments of air-filled small bowel that are over three centimeters in diameter, and no perceptible colonic gas or stool. We also see more than 10 small bowel air fluid levels in dilated small bowel of various height from the ground. Large bowel obstructions typically occur in the downstream colon and in older patients. Abdominal x-rays are relatively sensitive for picking up large bowel obstructions, though they're slightly less specific um, for large bowel obstructions and for small bowel obstructions. Most large bowel obstructions are caused by colorectal cancer, though there are many other causes too, which I've listed on this slide. X-ray findings of a large bowel obstruction include gas-filled dilated cecum and colon upstream from the colonic obstruction site. The rectum and any colon downstream from the obstruction will be collapsed and imperceptible on X-ray. Sometimes, air fluid levels may be present in colon upstream from the colonic obstruction. However, since the colon is great at reabsorbing water, colonic air fluid levels tend to disappear as the obstruction becomes more chronic, leaving distended colon filled only with gas. If the ileocecal valve is competent in the setting of a large bowel obstruction, the bowel gas pattern in the small bowel may appear normal. However, if the ileocecal valve is incompetent, you may also see abnormally dilated small bowel and abnormal air fluid levels in the small bowel too. If colonic wall necrosis or perforation eventually occur, complications such as colonic wall pneumatosis, portal venous gas, or pneumoperitoneum may be present too. Be aware that bowel wall pneumatosis can sometimes be tough to differentiate from pseudo-pneumatosis caused by air trapping in stool or air trapped against the bowel wall by stool, and ends up being something that CT imaging can be helpful in resolving. In this case of a large bowel obstruction, there are multiple segments of dilated air-filled colon and small bowel in the abdomen, but no bowel gas within the sigmoid colon and rectum. Mechanical bowel obstructions can be classified in many ways. Bowel obstructions can be complete, resulting in inclusion of the entire bowel lumen, or they can be partial, where some bowel contents can pass through. In cases of partial small bowel obstruction, some amount of gas may be present in non-distended GI tract downstream of the obstruction, resulting in a disparity in expected bowel diameter upstream versus downstream. Bowel obstructions can also be classified as simple versus complicated. In a simple bowel obstruction, the blood supply to the bowel wall is intact, while in a complicated bowel obstruction, 
the blood supply to a segment of the bowel is compromised, which can lead to bowel ischemia, infarct, and perforation. Here's an example of a strangulated hernia on this um, CT, where a short segment of the small bowel became trapped in the anterior, in the, uh, anterior abdominal wall after passing through a small defect in the muscular layer of the deep anterior abdominal wall. Due to the small size of the muscle wall defect, the afferent and efferent small bowel segments passing through the hernia have become obstructed. Bowel obstructions where two points along a segment of bowel are obstructed at a single location are called closed loop obstructions. The closed loop in this particular case being the small bowel segment that's trapped in the anterior abdominal um, wall superficial to the muscular wall. A closed loop bowel obstruction results in multiple gas fold segments of distended small bowel upstream and thickening of the valvulae canaventes plainly visible on this abdominal x-ray. The stomach um, in this case is not dilated since it's being decompressed um, by a nasogastric tube. A dynamic ileus. Um, a dynamic ileus has a different etiology from mechanical bowel obstruction and occurs when peristalsis in the GI tract has slowed down or has come to a stop. Reasons why peristalsis um, is arrested um, may include things like narcotics, uh, recent manipulation of the GI tract, trauma, inflammation of or near the GI tract, and sometimes systemic causes. Although the x-ray appearance of adynamic ileus may resemble mechanical bowel obstruction at first glance, adynamic ileus can often be distinguished from a mechanical bowel obstruction since there shouldn't be a focal obstruction point with uh, downstream GI tract um, clearance and collapse. While the x-ray findings of adynamic ileus include gas or air fluid levels in distended small bowel, cecum, and colon, the distension will usually be diffuse and extend all the way to the rectum. In this example of adynamic ileus, um, the entire GI tract is gas filled and diffusely distended, including the sigmoid colon and rectum, without a difference in how severe the distension is upstream versus downstream, unlike with mechanical bowel obstructions, where the downstream colon or downstream small bowel and entire colon are collapsed and imperceptible due to an absence of stool and bowel gas. Uh, while the upstream GI tract is distended. Inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease primarily refers to two idiopathic disorders, um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Abdominal x-rays are generally not ideal for working up patients with active inflammatory bowel disease as abdominal x-rays may appear normal in a majority of these cases. However, when abdominal x-ray abnormalities do occur, their presence can sometimes be helpful in prompting a more thorough diagnostic workup um, um, or uh, revealing the presence of a complication of inflammatory bowel disease, such as bowel perforation. While extras may be negative in the setting of Crohn's disease, some cases can present radiographically with any of the imaging findings characteristic of adynamic ileus, mechanical um, small bowel obstruction, and partial obstruction since all of these outcomes are possible in the setting of Crohn's disease. And while Crohn's disease predominantly involves small bowel, the colon can be involved in up to 20% of cases, meaning that findings characteristic for mechanical large bowel obstruction are possible too. With the acute and chronic inflammation that occur with Crohn's disease, thickened valvular conventes, thickened haustrofolds and thumb printing, and absence of haustrofolds and more chronic inflammation can all occur. Lastly, bowel perforation is a known complication of Crohn's disease, which can result in free gas in the peritoneal cavity. In effect, um, almost every single finding on this table may potentially present in an x-ray of a patient with Crohn's disease. In this example of Crohn's disease with uh, involvement with colon, we can observe that the haustrofolds folds of the colon are thickened and that a couple of dilated air-filled small bowel loops are also present in mid-abdomen. X-ray findings of ulcerative colitis are mostly confined to the colon and include gas-filled or abnormal um, air fluid levels in dilated colon. Loss of colonic haustration or abnormally thickened haustra and thumb printing can both present. Colonic perforation is a potential complication in severe cases, which can result in free gas in the peritoneal cavity on X-ray. In this case of ulcerative colitis, pronounced haustral fold thickening and thumb printing are present in the colon, while the bowel gas pattern in the small bowel appears normal. Sentinel loops. Um, a, sentinel, a sentinel loop 
can occur when a focal inflammatory process in the abdomen leads to focal adynamic ileus within a short segment of adjacent small bowel. A sentinel loop in the right upper quadrant can occur in the setting of disorders like acute cholecystitis or pyelonephritis, while a sentinel loop in the right lower um, quadrant may occur in the setting of a disorder like appendicitis. Abdominal x-ray findings in the setting of a sentinel loop are straightforward, being a short segment of dilated small bowel. In this example, a short segment of gas-filled dilated small bowel, distinct from the colon, is present in the right lower quadrant of this patient, who ultimately was diagnosed with acute appendicitis. Toxic megacolon. This is a complication that can occur in the setting of a severe colon inflammation or infection um, that, resulting, that results in complete loss of the colon's neurogenic tone. Um, with loss of the colon's neurogenic tone, we can um, develop severe colonic dilation with the risk of perforation. X-ray findings of toxic megacolon are severe colon distension and loss of haustral folds. Dilation of the transverse colon can be as great as 15 centimeters diameter. In cases where the colon has perforated, free intraperitoneal gas may also be visible. In this example of toxic megacolon, the transverse colon is gas-filled, severely dilated, and relatively featureless, as all the haustral folds are absent. Finally, pneumoperitoneum is the presence of gas inside the peritoneal cavity, but not within the GI tract. Although the most common cause is recent abdominal surgery, the feared cause is bowel perforation, an acute surgical emergency that, if not dealt with promptly, can lead to death. Pneumoperitoneum can be um, um, uh, tough to spot on supine abdominal radiographs. Um, traditionally, upright chest x-rays, such as in this image, are considered to be um, the more sensitive um, x-ray study and can exhibit the classical presentation of gas rising to the top of the abdomen and collecting on the diaphragm um, in pneumoperitoneum, like on this image. Countless um, other potential presentations of free intraperitoneal gas have been described on x-rays, um, and I'd like to show you three of them at least. Um, there's Wrigler sign, which is the presence of gas on both sides of bowel wall, bowel wall um, allowing the bowel wall itself to become visually discernible on chest on, a, on an abdominal x-ray. There's the continuous diaphragm sign, where air is trapped immediately underneath the midline diaphragm. While we can sometimes encounter nonspecific gas beneath the left hemidiaphragm due to the stomach bubble or gas beneath the right hemidiaphragm due to interposed colon, gas usually does not approach the midline diaphragm like in this case, unless it's extra luminal. And then there's the football sign, where such a large amount of air has accumulated that it begins to outline the entire peritoneal cavity, which is basically shaped like a large oval or football. So to summarize, be cautious when you encounter any of these abnormal abdominal gas features when you're reading an abdominal x-ray. Now, let's review the top abnormal calcifications you need to be on the lookout for when you're interpreting an abdominal x-ray for acute abdominal pain. Objects like gallstones, urinary tract, calculi, appendicolyphs, pancreatic calcifications, and vascular calcifications are important to look for. They can sometimes hint at the cause of a patient's acute abdominal pain, though certainly they can often also end up being just true-true unrelated in some patients too. Nonetheless, when we spot them on an abdominal x-ray and haven't established an explanation for our patient's acute abdominal pain yet, their presence of any of these calcifications um, often should prompt more investigation, often with a more diagnostic modality like ultrasound or CT since some gallstones can occlude the lumen of the gallbladder neck, leading to biliary colic or acute cholecystitis. Some urinary tract calculi can occlude the ureter, leading to acute renal colic and a urinary tract obstruction. Some appendicolyphs can occlude the appendiceal lumen, leading to acute appendicitis. Um, an aortic dissection, aortic ulcer, intramural hematoma, or impending rupture could always be potentially brewing with any pre-existing abdominal aortic aneurysm. And pancreatic calcifications may indicate the presence of chronic pancreatitis.